see yourself in five years? Um, physically, professionally, uh, all of Open that. Question. Okay. Um, of course, uh, I wouldn't be applying for this position if I didn't feel that I could be here for um, a long term. And I think I addressed that uh, last night, that, that that would be a goal. Um, I'm looking for a place to be uh, settled and very productive for a long period of time. Uh, looking for that stability. Um, so I, I would like to be here. And uh, moving us or have moved uh, us from uh, to good to great, that was described last night. So I see myself uh, fitting in right here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dawson, <coughs> what are some of the potential roadblocks to the successful uh, technology integration other than funding? Um, you know, lo logistics. Uh, my experience in the past is uh, the logistics of uh, uh, the facilities. Sometimes the facilities haven't been designed or uh, ready to accept uh, where the technology needs to go. Um, I've experienced that in creating wireless environments uh, in buildings. Uh, I've, you know, rooms, uh, if you go into some classrooms or rooms in uh, schools, maybe there's a plug in the front and a plug in the back. <laughs> and it's just not equipped uh, for the integration of technology. And, uh, so those, those are some of the physical barriers. Um, the ability to manipulate technology may be a barrier by staff, by students. Uh, so there's a learning experience engaged with uh, technology, and some training may be in, involved. Uh, some uh, we've been moving for uh, smart boards or some technical boards in the classrooms, and um, you just can't stick them to the wall without anticipating some learning experiences that need to accompany those. So. Uh, once you purchase and engage in that technology process, you have to make those investments that we're utilizing its, that technology to its potential. So those are some of the barriers that I could potentially see and, and have dealt with in the past. Mr. Stoneman, mm -hmm. associated with that question, you talked about logistics, you know, the hardware, um, the wiring, and you talked about what I would call maybe professional development or professional training, the ability of staff to manipulate the devices and work with kids with them. Yes. But what about um, what about other roadblocks like the idea, like maybe perhaps a fear of technology because it's new, um, about the idea of kids taking online classes because that's not how it's been done, and in fact maybe a threat to a teacher's job in the long run. Yes. Do you see any roadblocks in that area, or have you never encountered anything like that? Of course. Uh, there's an example uh, I talked about the South East Michigan uh, Cyber Academy. And we mm -hmm. talked about uh, my sensitivity, how it may affect brick and mortar students that we have, and how that may affect the uh, class sizes and so forth related to stealing kids from brick and mortar and put them in a cyber environment. Um, but I think if we don't move in that direction, other school districts and other opportunities kids will find in other locations. So and in other districts. So if we don't take advantage of it ourselves in our own districts, we potentially could be losing our students. You know, I hate to refer them to customers, but that when we were talking about finances, that's kind of what it is. So we don't want to lose our student population for other opportunities that are being generated that kids are taking advantage in that technology environment. So where do you see yourself in five years? You know, when I came to Reed City 15 years ago, they asked me that question. I said, as long as I'm happy doing my job, I'll try to be in Reed City. And as you know, I love my job in Reed City, and that's why I'm still here. Um, so I'm in good shape there. I love my job in Reed City. Um, I'll be here working here. Thank you. Mr. Carlson, when you're ready. What are some potential roadblocks to successful technology integration other than funding? Well, you have staff is not familiar with a lot of the technology. Um, we need to get staff on board with technology, and we need to professionally develop people so they can see the need or the use or the advantage of using the technology. You can show somebody a smart board and have them be all happy about it, 
And it's oh, that's cute and does all kinds of finicky little things. But if they don't know how to use it, or they don't see how it's going to help kids learn more or learn better, they're not going to buy in. So we need to expose our staff. Our teachers love to teach. They love to teach. And if they can find a better way, there are teachers, and actually my wife is constantly reading, latest, latest research says, here's what you do, here's how you do it. If technology can help her do that, she's all over it. And so as my job, I need to get out and make sure our staff is exposed to technological experiences or, or possibilities so they can use that in their classroom. Money is the number one though. Mr. Webster, as a follow-up to that, um, you talked about staff learning how to use the technology. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, any development needs to be done in, in, in attitudes towards new technology? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say online classes. As you know, because you share the media center with the high school, you know that we have a computer lab there and that there, uh, there's been a mentor in that room and there's been some attempts at online learning that have gone yeah. Um, okay. How do you feel that that yeah. hurdle could be overcome to increase that, or do you think that hurdle should be there? That that's that's kind of a bad road to go down. Why did it go? Yeah. Was it because it wasn't the right student, the different learning style that that student really wasn't, or was it wasn't? It would be speculation on my part, but I believe communication um, between various levels of administration and the students played a, a large factor in it, the lack of communication. Okay. Um, I think students were confused, for instance, about whether the grades would count, um, is it pass-fail, um, how difficult is it, some things like that that perhaps weren't communicated effectively enough. But what do you think about a program like that? Do you think that's uh, worthwhile? I, well, that's an absolute, those opportunities that we can't offer here now, a Class B school is, in my opinion, the perfect size school to raise your children in. Smaller than a Class B school, and they quite often don't offer the opportunities. They don't have, it's too hard to make a sport, or in a Class D school, you make every sports team, and you really don't get a great sports team experience quite often because it's so small and they can't offer a lot of things. Maybe they don't even offer some of the sports that you want. A Class A school with 5,000 students, it's kind of hard to make a basketball team with a, with a school of 5,000 seniors and 5,000. So in my opinion, a Class B school, that's one of the reasons why I came to Reed City, because we like that. Even though a Class B school offers a lot, we can't offer everything. And anytime we can open up the door and invite people in, students in, to take something like a marine biology class that we don't offer, or we only have two people that want it or need it, we can do that through technology. That's that's wonderful. Let's let's encourage that. But let's do it in such a way that everybody knows what expectations are, and we screen students and communicate. Thank you, Mr. You know, yeah. Uh, Superintendent spends uh, most of the time in four areas. I'm not saying that that's the only areas that we spend our time in, but in these four areas of labor relations, finances, community and staff relationships and curriculum, what percentage of the time would you estimate you would spend on these categories? Not knowing, not, no, not saying that those are the only four areas. Right. No, I understand that. Um, had I been a superintendent for a while, I'd probably be able to better guess that. But you know, as I look at that, um, labor relations would probably be the majority of the time, community would probably be the next. Financial would probably be next. And then curriculum. Actually, late, have we done anything curriculum in the last five years? Yeah, at GT Norman. Oh, well, yeah, okay, in the last two months. We did math, too. Well, we got, we got some minimal district run curriculum. And actually, that's funded through something different than, because we don't have any money for curriculum for the last five years. That's where I was headed with that. At least that's what I was told. Your building, perhaps, but yeah, we do have a we do have a curriculum we do have a curriculum account each year. Uh, yeah, actually, we've actually good things about the new curriculum director and things that she's doing down there. Um, would you would you think that that would be an everyday basis, though, on, as far as those 
types of uh, percentages that you think, or do you, or do you think it would change at any time? You know what? To be honest with you, I'm gonna go in there. And when it, when it, something rolls across my desk, I'm gonna deal with it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make the time to deal with it. And if I have to stay late, I'm gonna stay late and deal with it. Um, there are multiple times when I've been at the middle school, not lately, because I've got a lot more organized than, than when I first got going. There were times when I went home, took a shower, changed my clothes, and came back to work. Because um, when things need to be done, they need to be done. So, whatever time I need to spend, I'll get it done.